So let's talk about dark money and what has recently happened with the uh, Democratic Party and them refusing to ban dark money in those primaries. And I've seen you kind of uh, go on a uh, uh, sort of a a tour. And you've said this over over several months. You've been trying to narrow down what's the best strategy for you know going forward and who you know trying to get it narrowed down to sort of deliver it uh to your audience but then we have this which to me um it makes the strategy of progressive democrats of justice democrats it's it's flawed in many areas but in this particular part it's sort of for me like a now what it's like now they've basically thrown down the gauntlet because the only people that this is going to affect dark money is progressives. This is what this is specifically targeted to because it's not any GOP. It's not any, you know, Republicans. Um, this is to target progressives like what happened with Nina Turner. So it always comes back to me. And this was the first question that, I, that came to me, Bree, when, when this these news, the news about dark money in the Democratic uh, Committee, whatever the committee is called, it's what does it take for progressives to wake up? Like, what does it take for progressive to say, like, you are a progressive, you believe in A, B, and C, which the Democrats do not believe in any, but how many things do the Democratic Party have to keep adding on to the layers of corruption, the layers of just bad decisions, the layers of non-working class sort of uh, uh, policies, how many of that, how much of that needs to be layered on before you say, where is the red line is the question I have. So could you sort of uh, speak to that? Could you speak to that, uh, yeah. that point? I any surrounding sort of topics you want to add in there? I want to keep it broad for you. Go ahead. Yeah, so again, like I know people, it, it can be frustrating for me sometimes because I see comments like, Oh, I'm glad Brianna's coming around on this. Or, well, Brianna, Brianna's so close, but she doesn't quite get it. Like, guys, like, I got it. I've, I've been on it. But I have a responsibility to an audience. And there, if there, if people want to go and have already made up their mind and hear people who already agree with them about Dim Exit, there's obviously spaces for that. But I see my role uh, in the, the fact that there are some folks that invest with a certain degree of credibility for various reasons, not all of which are earned, but which are there, um, to help people come to the process through the same way that I came to the process without just having been, been you know, telling them, you must just believe that the Democratic Party is over. Well, how did I come to this conclusion? I came through it experientially, so let me expose them to the same kind of experiences that I had. Besides which, I'm relatively new to politics. I never want to seem so you know, hubristic to think that I know all the answers to everything, especially when I'm talking to people who've been in this for so much longer than I have and have so much more knowledge than I do. So in these interviews, my goal has been to ask the questions that I think any reasonable person would ask about why working in the Democratic Party would yield any different results. What changes can be made? Let's be honest about the barriers and the obstacles that are in the way. And then do you have an argument about how to get around them? Do you have an argument that justifies not doing a different strategy? And I've talked to labor organizers who've, I think, done a lot of blustering and a lot of, look, obviously organizing, organizing is so important, but you simultaneously don't want to talk about a general strike. And also you just pivot to organize, organize. Every time I ask you a specific question about, well, what should we do to capitalize on the Black Lives Matter protests? What should we do to capitalize on the fact that there are people who are, I'm so sorry. That is my mother. No worries. No worries. Um, uh, to capitalize on the fact that there are um, so many, uh, it, there, there was a, an electoral demand, like a, there was an electoral lever that existed in 2020. And if they're so desperate to win, what can we extract? What can we do to capitalize on midterms? And so often I have one camp of people who are organizers who say, we don't have the union density to really ask for much. All we got to do is organize. We can't take advantage of COVID. We can't take advantage of the lockdowns. We can't take advantage of people feeling like they really need health care. Let's just punt this for later. And on the other side, there are some um, there's some people who are so, I think, disenchanted with electoralism that they don't even want to use it as like a political strategy. 
So I would talk to, let's say, people who I obviously adore and respect a great deal, like Chris Hedges, and say, okay, well, do you think we should just sit out and pay no attention to elections then? Which is, that's a valid answer. And he said, no, I don't. And so when I say, okay, well, what then should we do? Like, how can we use this as a point of leverage? You know, the, I don't get the necessarily the specifics that I, I want to hear. I'm, I'm hearing that electoralism is useless, but also we shouldn't set that election. So let's talk strategically. But sometimes I find when I talk strategically about what to do, how to exploit election cycles to get real concessions for the left, I'm accused of like caring too much about electoral politics or thinking electoral politics are going to save us. <laughs> well, no. Even Chris Hedges said we shouldn't sit it out. Sh Shama Salat said we shouldn't sit it out. So what do we do? And so when pressing people on the specifics, what I've discovered is when I talk to candidates, those are real kind of revealing moments because candidates are often like they're great people. They really mean well. They share our interests. But there's been a, a few that have come through the show. You know, one dropped out of a race after talking to me on the show and to the people on Colin because she was having a hard time kind of justifying participating and giving so much of herself and her personal money, which she didn't have a lot of, to this this situation where the party was aligned against her, where she was getting knocked by the Democrats. Yes. But when I talk to people like that have been beat up the most, when I talk to um, uh, India Walton, for instance. You know, who, who has had a better front row seat to how vile the Democratic Party is to its own candidates than her? She won her primary within the Democratic Party to be the mayor of Buffalo. She won fair and square. And that same establishment machine that normally says, oh, well, we're going to just support the Democratic nominee, you know, ultimately didn't really come to her defense in a robust way when her opponent beat her in a write-in campaign. A writing campaign still managed to knock her out. And so when I talk to these people, what I'm expecting, people like her with people like Zogby, what I'm expecting is to hear from them triple the amount of outrage as the normal, a regular person because they were personally affected by this. And when I see that they don't seem to be as angry as we are, or at least they don't seem to be as right. willing to call out the people who allied against them within the party as we are, what it feels like is that they're making the decision. And this is not, you know, personal. I, I adore and I adore all of these people. But what it feels like as a voter, as an organizer, as an outsider, as a worker, is that they're choosing to still protect the Democratic Party establishment rather than to give voice to the obvious thing that we can all see, which is that the Democratic Party stabbed them in the back. And they think they can occupy this neutral position of, um, you know, mm -hmm. yes, so well, <laughs> you know, <laughs> You know, it, it, just, it just doesn't gel for people. And I try to explain it to them because I want them to see that people could still have confidence in their ability to actually do adversarial politics and, and be useful, even running, uh, participating in electoralism. Ralph Nader was useful. Third, third, you know, outsider third party campaigns are useful. But there is this perception, and you heard this in the Zogby interview, that if you want to do anything other than running within the Democratic Party, you're giving up. You, you're not fighting. And there's this characterization of it as an as an action, which I think is really disrespectful to the people who are, in fact, very active. They just see that doing the same old thing over and over again within the Democratic Party is doomed to fail. And that is the most inactive, you that's know, what you can do. That's why I'm, that's why I'm uh, glad he pushed back, because that's the point in the interview I saw and I thought was a highlight. Because they always assume, and I get this all the time, and this is the people who claim that we're nihilists. And right. this whole thing, what you're doing is very valuable. I don't know why people don't understand it. To me, it's very clear. I, I definitely understand what you're trying to do. Because what you do, you did a good job formulating our arguments to them in a way they never hear before. Because a lot of them, I have noticed, pretend they don't understand our strategy. And these same people, I'm not going to say any names, but Schroeder and Do Your Interview comes up to mind, where they say, oh, these people don't got a plan. They're nihilists. If, if you're not supporting Democrats, then what? I'm like, how many times have we laid out our theory of change? I've been very clear, and I think, um, and I got evidence to back this up, I think a large constituent of the working class that give validity to this two-party duopoly hurts our movement. I and they're not even, and you, I think I heard you like kind of illustrate this in your interviews as well, and they don't even understand this point. Because by you giving legitimacy to their system, you strip our worker uh, leverage away. Because what I want, I want a third party where we can get at least 15 to 20 percent. Because scientific socialism has taught us and revolutions has taught us, you don't, people, revolution is not waived by 70 percent of the population. You need 15 to 20 percent. And then you got three percent. Yeah, there's a lot of people that say even less. I will argue personally, I think maybe, 
I would personally, especially right now, I probably personally play at 15. I think we need 50%. But I think we get like 15%, probably even less than that. Then you defeat the 30% who won't move. Then the rest are people who just want to live life. They see stuff get shut down. Then they're like, man, come on, just give them health care already. All right, I'm joining their side because they're just. And that's the third party movement trying to do. You get 5%, you get federal funding. You get 15%, you get on the debate stage. They never bring this up. So I get frustrated, and I'm glad you bring this stuff up to them because I never hear them even have to address these basic points that they don't, they don't even seem to understand. That's my rant. CJ Bree, do you want to take it from there? Yeah, I, I actually have something for Bree. Um, it's along the lines oh. of the point that she was making. It's a clip from uh, uh, the interview you did with uh, Kashama, and I'm, and I'm going to have Kashama in a joint interview with Kashama and Dr. Jill Stein soon, so I'll, I'll, announce, I'll announce that soon. Um, but this is this. Well, let me let me play the, the the video or the clip and then I'll I'll ask the question at the end. There absolutely should be a progressive challenger, challenger from the left in a, in a, in a militant campaign. I absolutely don't think it should be from the Democratic Party. And I mm. do want to address the specific names that you brought up. But mm. before doing that, I want to say. Uh, it's much more about the strategy, the political strategy that we as working people use to bring a real challenge to the Democratic and Republican candidates. And the starting point, the ABCs of that strategy, are you don't run as a Democrat. Because look at what they did to Bernie Sanders. You know, uh, every Tom, Dick, and Harry of progressive Democrats supported Bernie in 2020. They were, you know, when I went to the Tacoma Dome to speak at Bernie's rally, they were all there with me. I know mm -hmm. these people. They don't support Bernie's politics, but they were there because everybody, it was so easy. There was nothing at stake to get on the Bernie bandwagon at that time and yet then go ahead and support Biden once Bernie was crushed because we all knew that was going to happen. The Democratic Party elite were going to use some trick or another to get Bernie off the books. And then you then you got James Clyburn, you got South Carolina, and lo and behold, it happened. We had we didn't know exactly how it would happen, but it, we knew it would happen. So the first obligation we have as people on the left, if we are serious organizers, if we have any loyalty to the working class, is to first be crystal clear about that. Whether it makes you popular or not, be crystal clear. The Democratic Party is not the way to go. And I don't want to hear uh, you know, these things that people could come up with on the left where They'll say, well, it's the, it's the ballot line, it's the technicality. No, this is no technicality. This is, if you don't run as an independent, you are not taking on the, the, the fight that needs to be taken on, which is to present an in, independent fight back. And if you don't, it, it, Bernie was the strongest expression so far of the burning desires that working people have. And I, you know, I have a lot of uh, appreciation for Bernie, but look what happened. It went nowhere. And, 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 that's, and that's the point. Or, or what I want to ask or to set up the question is, um, it's like um, the strategy has been proven not to work, this progressive, this building out, this Democratic Party. This dark money has come in to solidify that the Democratic Party doesn't want you. You see what happened to Nina Turner. I don't understand what I don't understand from the from the professional managerial class who have these degrees is how are you this intelligent, but you can't see that you're trying to squeeze a square peg in a round hole. That's not working. And they keep yeah. adding, they keep, you know, now they're changing a hole from a square, or a, a, a circle to a hexagon. It's like they're making it even worse. So it's like, it begins to get to a point, Bree, where it's now for me, it's like now I'm beginning to get to the point where it almost feels like you're working against the working class because you're willing to yes. hang on to a strategy. You're willing to hang on to a strategy you know that prolongs pain and suffering. You're going to be fine, professional managerial class. But the people who are at the bottom are not. So it begins to get to me. And I think RBN, I saw Nick shake his head. It's like, now I'm starting to think you are willing to at least, maybe you're not work, you're not, you're not physically thinking or literally thinking like I'm working against them, but you're willing to at least throw them under the bus. And 
that's yeah. not what I'm willing to do. Can you speak to any part of that uh, point? There? Yeah. So literally th this, for all of the weird tweet storm that happened around the Chomsky interview, this was literally the central point that I was trying to get across from him. This is the question I kept asking him over and over again for an hour with no response. <laughs> It was, I come, it was, it was what, like a couple weeks before the election that this interview happened. I think it was episode 10 of Bad Faith. And I said to him, I am not indifferent to or ignorant of the harms that can accrue if Donald Trump is reelected. But what you have to answer, what I would like to hear you speak to, is the harms that absolutely will accrue and have been accruing for generations because we have been laboring under the status quo. And what do you have to say about all of the groups that have been harmed under the status quo? There's a lot of focus, and rightly so, about the Muslim ban and anti-LGBTQ sentiments and the anti-trans stuff and all of the kind of newer stuff that, that Trumpism has fomented and brought to the fore. But at any point, is there going to be a conversation about everyone who gets grandfathered in all the time, historically marginalized groups, Black people, Brown people, Native Americans in this country, who we say every year, okay, I know things are really bad, but like there's this new threat. And so we just can't deal right. with you right now. You know, can you, can you tell me, say something to me that will demonstrate that you're actually weighing the pro cons of infinite incrementalism versus taking a risk? <laughs> are you actually thinking about it and weighing the cons or are you just so risk averse? Is this such a trolley problem that you're willing to let all of these people suffer and be grandfathered in because they just aren't your people, right? And, and this is this is what's becoming increasingly apparent. Even if there was an argument for working an inside strategy, talking to Zogby, seeing what happened to um, Nina Turner and India Walton, talk, you know, hearing, uh, there was a window where at least progressives could get elected. Sure, fine, 2018, we had this wave and like there was, yeah. I think a lot of us are really open to what they might be able to do. But when force the vote happens and we have this perfect storm with the narrow margins in the house and their ability to block anything and they don't, when you see them not go to bat over the $15 minimum wage, when you see that they've really executed the strategy now that they can prevent you from getting elected in the first place by using dark money within the Democratic Party, they don't even have to say anything bad about you. They know that APAC got your back. They, right. they, know, they know that they can smear these candidates. And, and get them gone without even having to lift a finger the way they back. Back in 2018, there were all these articles about how oh, the Democratic Party is going to, to sit to blacklist vendors that help insurgent candidates. And they were doing all of this. They've streamlined their strategy. Literally, all they have to do is put the dark money in the race and you're not going to win. So when it's gotten that bad, how can you even really be credibly be arguing for an inside strategy when you literally can yes. hardly get elected anymore? Yes. Yes, it is. It is a terrible. I'm so happy, uh, Bree. You you are part of the revolutionary side. We need somebody in the in the professional managerial class that's trying to explain this to them. So let me go to this clip now. We've had Catherine, a uh, professor Catherine Liu, on. She's a professor at uh, UCI here in Irvine. That's not too far from me. Um, and her, we discussed her book, The Case Against the Professional Managerial Class. So let me, because she it speaks to the same point that we're talking here. Let me let me play this part, um, and then we can further this conversation. That's where I'll stop it there. Our interests, PMC's interests, are not aligned with workers' interests. Can you can you explain what you mean by that, or can you go into more detail about that particular part? Um. So, you know, even when they're progressives and they say like, oh, we want um, just social justice and we want equality, they don't really, the PMC as a class generally has a really hard time dealing with like um, workers' interests and workers' struggles. And they don't really see themselves as workers or people who can be organized because they identify with the with the values of the managers and the capitalists. Mm. So it's all about extracting efficiency and labor from laborers. Like, uh, you know. So maybe I'm going to pause it there because uh, maybe uh, it's about extracting labor and efficiency and doing anything outside of an institution or electoralism. It's just too mur much work. It's not as efficient for the PMC or for the professional uh, managerial 
uh, class. Now, I I'm going to finish the clip and then allow, uh, but I, I needed to insert there because there's more I got to insert at the end. And then I'll allow you to kind of speak to all of it, uh, Brie. Hang on. No, um... Like saying, shut up and just go vote. Just, oh, oh yeah, that's like an incredible thing. Um, and I think all the culture war things are about that. Mm -hmm. You know, like it's all about cultural consumption, lifestyle practices. This is a lot about what my book is about, right? Because it's really hard. If we have, if Americans have a hard time w focusing on what it is to be a worker, it's because of this class. All of our ideological content is about like empowering ourselves through consumption habits. Like, oh, I'm... You know, I want to go green. I have solar panels. I do this. I do that. It's yeah. all people who are really wealthy who can make those choices who appear progressive. But what it is to be a worker, what it is to have a working day, how that working day is um, governed, all of these nitty gritty issues, these are workers' issues. And um, what our benefits are, what our... Um, Healthcare is, you guys just did that whole thing on healthcare. Do you know the single m most important thing right now for m the American worker, women, I don't care what, um, and um, what race you are, is Medicare for all. Why was that such a hard issue for people to wrap their heads around in 2016 and in 2020? So I think uh, Catherine Liu, who was great, and we're, we're going to have her back on sometime uh, uh, soon, but... What she's basically saying here is that the professional managerial class interests don't uh, necessarily align with working class. And this is the reason why here at RBN, we vigorously uh, uh, call out people who keep trying to sheep her the working class back to this party that is not there to help us. So maybe this, you know, this uh, pull and pull because the reformist versus revolutionary lines are, are quite overlapping and they're very parallel to the professional managerial lines too and the working class. So they're very similar lines. And so, you know, I, I am kind of ranting on, but the point of what I'm trying to get at here is it's, it feels like we have part of the left that is saying, forget those at the very bottom, the poor and working class. Because on, as a side note, too, a lot of times when professional managerial class is talking about working class, they're talking about working class with degrees, like like nurses, not mm -hmm. the poor, the poorest uh, working class. But it feels like... Are they talking about JB when they, when they say that? That's exactly. What, 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 where does he fall in? Um, it feels like a lot of what the issue is, is that we have part of the left that's willing to throw the other half of the left under the bus to sell us out with the police aid, to sell us out with, you know, funding the Iron Dome, to sell us out on just so many different levels and not fight back as a person who's supposedly fighting for the working class. So I'm uh, so what I'm getting to is this, Brie. I don't see what is in the progressive strategy that is for the working class and poor. Like, what's in it for them is, is just something I don't see. So could you speak to all of that? I know I kind of ran yeah. off any part of that you want to talk about. No, so it's so interesting because this came out with my, in my interview with Dr. Zogby a little bit, right? Where he says, you know, there's all of this focus on the people the people on top of the folks who are already hurting under the status quo, who will be, you know, how, how much worse things can get, basically. There's a lot of focus on how much worse things can get, which kind of is a tell. It's a tell about the investment in the status quo. And even though people, these are not bad people, they understand that things are very that bad for a lot of people, at least in like an abstract academic sense. But Absolutely. there is an unwillingness to risk things getting worse so that they could potentially get better. And that's scary, right? Like I'm, I am a relatively comfortable person and I don't, I would never be the one to like fire the first gun in the air and say, everybody go into the streets. Cause that's not, <laughs> on, that's not for me to say, right? I don't feel like that's my right. goal. Right. However, I have spoken to enough people to observe that the, the people who are from a more, um, I don't want to say sincerely working class. I don't know how you want to distinguish the degreed working class versus not, or, you know, the utility of even making those distinctions. But when I talk to people who call in 
when I listen to, you know, when I look at Reddit threads, when I read comment sections, when I talk to family members, what I hear is a much stronger appetite to take the risk right. from the people who are already suffering under the status quo than people who are not suffering under the status quo. I'm not saying it. I'm not the one building the ramparts. But it doesn't feel right to me to be saying, let's kick the can down the road and do incrementalism when I'm so comfortable, when someone who's much less comfortable right. than I am is actually right. willing to take the hit. Now, one of the most, uh, you know, this whole, point. Great point. you know, this whole experience of like doing bad faith and having the call-in show in particular has been really revelatory for me. And I am, I'm really not blowing smoke when I say that I learned so much from the audience and the call-in folks in particular and it's very humbling to be in this position. And I feel a great deal of responsibility about being in this position to have, been, to have, the, have the platform. And I learn a lot from folks. And one of the most humbling experiences of all of this was when last fall, I don't really know, my, my, my mother was not close to her biological father. He passed away, he went to the funeral and kind of met that side of the family in Cleveland. And I met one of my cousins who's like an adult and he's a, he drives a truck and he was like, oh, you're Brianna Gray. <laughs> I listened to your podcast. <laughs> I had no idea we were related. And it it was, it you know, and he was talking to me about why he listened and all these other kinds of things. And all of those kinds of experiences, when, when he tells me and people like him and other people in my life tell me, you know, what they're willing to do and what they're willing to fight for and what appeals to them about a left strategy, you know, it's meaningful to me. So I, I, I don't think of myself as even really having opinions. I feel like I'm collecting facts and opinions and just kind of realities about the world and like but running them through an analytical filter to come out with the conclusion that I think is kind of undeniable, which is that there are a lot of people, we are, we are approaching a tipping point of quantity of people who are sufficiently being screwed by the, yeah. by the betrayal of the American dream that they are willing to take risks that they haven't been willing to take in the past. And I think the combination of Barack Obama and the, the promise he presented that failed, followed up by Donald Trump, which was supposed to be the worst it could possibly get. And frankly, a lot of folks didn't experience a lot of difference in their lives under Obama or Trump. And I don't mean to minimize kids in cages and I don't mean to minimize you know the, the real things that he did the environmental harms that we weren't even really going to experience until down the pike. Like, I don't mean to minimize that. But for the average human being just working for the last eight years, it, 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 you there was a lot of kicking and screaming and telling people this is the worst that was ever going to get. And that's why we needed to vote for Biden. That's why we needed to vote for Hillary. And having experienced that, it's a little bit of a boy who cried wolf situation. And people are willing to say, screw it. Okay, Dr. Zogby, you're telling me that if we try this alternative strategy, I might end up with another Trump. Well, we survived that. Obviously, I know some people didn't. COVID, I understand. I understand those arguments and I don't want you to mean to be disrespectful of them. I'm just articulating what I hear. And people are saying I survived it and I'm willing to take the chance. That's such a good point. And I want to, I want to speak a little more and I'll pass CJ. And then we get a super chat. Remember, we got 30 minutes. We got JV and Savvy. So make sure you stay yeah. tuned. We got, a lot, we got a lot of content going on today. One thing I want to add, because there's such a great point that you mentioned. I notice people, and they tend to be privileged, they tend to ease caution. They used to, they follow the CI tactics list. So that's like number four. These people are always ease caution at every event. Force to vote is like the main thing that comes to my mind. But people are like, oh my God, we can't do this. All these people with healthcare, by the way. And all, all, <laughs> no risk. First of all, I, I just really want to be clear about this. There are risks sometimes that we just yes. have to calculate risks, right? If we crash, if we if we hold up a fight for 15 and we don't get COVID vaccines out as a consequence, there could be some downsides, like realistically, mm -hmm. but force the vote, zero downsides. <laughs> the only yeah. downside is that Nancy Pelosi is the speaker of the house, that there's like no speaker of the house for a few weeks while they sort it out. Like it's it's like, it was all over war, even if, and this is the thing, people are like, well, you can't prove it would have upsides. The, the less you can prove there are downsides, the less I need to be able to prove that there are upsides. Let's just throw it at the wall and see if it sticks, if there's no negative, if there are no negative consequences, right? And it's the same thing with this third party versus inside game argument. The less you're able to prove that an inside strategy works, the less I have to prove that the outside strategy right. works. Right, <laughs> right, right. That's great. such a that's such a great point. Um, now, my final video I want to bring up is of Nick, and it speaks to the same yeah, yeah, yeah. sort of thing. 
and it's and it's this articulates uh it um let's listen there's a class divide on the left right now where you have privileged motherfuckers with health care who get mad at poor and disenfranchised people for not liking the politicians that they like so why is this accepted on the left people wonder why i'm going off on the western left this is why this is why there is no solidarity in this movement so the privileged people they see people get left behind so if you don't support medicare fraud how many people are going to die because of that if you are not canceling student loan debt how many people are living in poverty because of your decision but meanwhile, privileged people, and I've seen their houses, it's not fair that I've seen it, but I've seen it, the people we're talking about, they make a lot of money. The people make a lot of money, and then they get mad at protesters for challenging their favorite politicians. And yes, I am mad, because I see people going along with it. I thought the left, I thought we were supposed to have class analysis. But apparently we don't. So when I get mad at the squad for funding the police more, how are you going to get mad at me for criticizing your favorite politicians when they are funding the oppressions, the forces of oppression that are killing us? You know why? Because you're a white privileged motherfucker who's staying at home knowing that you're not going to be a victim of police violence. So since you know you're not going to be a victim of police violence, you get mad at people who are calling out your favorite politicians for being compl uh, complicit with it. No, we are not allies. No, we are not friends unless you stay in our community. And I'm calling all these people out. Because I am tired of people putting the preference and the opinions and the emotional uh, health of the politicians over the activists. Amen, so, amen, where, Nick. Amen. So where I come from, so I'm going to get to the question. But where yeah. I come from, we should have even given them a fucking excuse like, oh, Rome, technically Rome wasn't the one who did. I don't care. We, I, My response to that was, are you telling me that working class people should not challenge your favorite politicians? You made the argument why we shouldn't be mad at Bernie. You made the argument why we should be mad at AOC. Instead of be like, oh my God, these, these activists, they're so toxic because they're mad at your favorite politician. Fuck you. I, I had to play well, all the way to the end of the part well, there. I gotta say this. I gotta say this. If you guys don't know why I'm so heated, <laughs> just to give you guys some context, that was after the March for America fraud. And remember the, the uh, march that Rome, our, our being brother, organized? They, I remember on Twitter, there was a bunch of ALC sickle fans. We all know they are. They was mad. It was like, look at this Marshall Medicare fraud that they ran. They all felt, they red, brown lines. They was booing ALC. They was booing ALC, and people made a big deal over it. And I was like, so? <laughs> Even if they was booing up, so? <laughs> Why are you guys protecting the politician over the activist? That's all I was eating. Just so you guys know, because they was upset with my brother. No, I, I, I played it so to see, so... Because I feel like um, reformists and some people in the professional managerial class, like you said, academically, they understand people are suffering, but they need to see and hear. And in that clip, you can see and hear the frustration in Nick's voice with like, you really like we're voice giving voice to really people who are dying at the hands of the police state. I personally know people shot by the police killed and you're mad because you like the politician who who works for us and who has a nice pension who has health care like is this even a serious thing so could you uh sort of speak to that because you i mean you were sort of wrapped up in all of this forced to vote back and forth kind of thing too so could you speak to that um please yeah look i feel very strongly that it is not my place and I definitely isn't a politician's place to try to tone police like the righteous anger of people who are being very affected by our deeply unequal society. I, you know, am frustrated sometimes when people look, every, every, no one's perfect and there's a critique for everybody. But yeah. I really think people misunderstand why it's necessary to have folks that have different kinds of tones across the left. I really appreciate why people want to listen to RBN and hear Nick go off and, and Matt had a break. I hear a lot of people away. <laughs> I, I, like, I appreciate why so many people are attracted to Jimmy Dore, who seems to be talking about the crisis with a level of energy that is actually correlated with how serious things right. are. You know, people don't want to, you know, some folks want to hear a dispassionate conversation because they see there's credibility in that. I'm happy to provide that for people who want that, but I also very much respect the need for people to have other kinds of outlets and other kinds of sources. And 
Um, you know, I, I do think that it can become an academic exercise for folks. You know, I, I, I see myself as being in a privileged position, but I'm also kind of a first generation of a person in that privileged position. And, you know, I hear my mother talking about how frustrating it is. You know, my, my grandma, my family is very young because my grandmother had my mom when she was 17. And so my grandmother's a, a relatively young woman. And my mom had me when she was like 24. So like we're all like kind of deep, you know, close to stack. <laughs> and so my, my great grandmother's not that old. Her, you know, she died when I was in my early 20s. And my mom, I remember having these conversations about how little her house was worth in Cleveland, how my great grandfather was a bricklayer who worked so hard. They had commuted, you know, migrated up from South Carolina. They had this really tough life and how proud they were to have bought that house. And how my mom spent all of her childhood memories in that house. And I went to that house and that house is still in the family. Now there's like three generations of people living in that house that is worth something like $15,000 because it's in this terrible neighborhood in Cleveland. And that's what happens to our communities. And that's the consequence of redlining and the generational wealth that was going to accrue to other kinds of communities didn't benefit Black people in those same kinds of ways. And my relatives who fought in in Vietnam and other wars didn't get the same benefits in terms of GI bills and those kinds. You know, these things feel very real. It's not just like I read a book about redlining, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I, I do feel that combination of proximity in terms of my personal life and also the clarity that comes with the advantages that I have. Having seen, having had a glimpse of the privilege because of my education and my professional life, I know shockingly well what the haves have and the have-nots don't and how unfair that system is and how rigged it is and when people are talking about oh well like not everyone can go to college yeah sure i want people who don't go to college to be fairly compensated and have a good quality of life as well but i also know that everybody who says that is going to send their kids to college because they know all of the doors that start to open and the life that they can access in the unequal world we live in right now today and so I think the combination of those things um, makes me kind of, I don't know, I, I'm, I have, a, a, I think, more humble deference for what I, what I don't know, because I'm, I'm less knowledgeable and I'm still very much learning about um, the strategies that can be deployed. I learn a lot from the union organizers, even if I'm frustrated that sometimes they don't have the same energy <laughs> that I would like to see them have. I learn a lot from the politicians and people like Zogby about what is the obstacles are in our way. And I'm grateful for him to talk about what we have to overcome. I learn a lot from all of these people and I'm genuinely grateful for them to, to, that they will are willing to come and talk to me at the same time that I think I have a little bit more, I don't know, I just am grateful for being grounded by these other aspects of my personal biography that make it feel very real to me. I guess we're talking about inside outside games and to the extent that I feel kind of um, I've been historically kind of open to both and interested in palpating the possibilities of both. It's because I've lived a little bit of an inside outside life. But the evidence has mounted and it's increasingly difficult for me to understand the justifications of banging one's head against the wall and doing the same thing that we've been doing for a long time now within the Democratic Party when it has refined its ability to keep progressives out right. the way it has right. done now.